So you're probably wondering, why is there a helicopter on a grouse hunt? Never before in history have we been so aware of our carbon footprint. And in fact, the grouse moors of Great Britain are doing their bit to capture as much carbon as possible. Today, we're going to have a little look at what these guys are doing for Mother Nature. Peatlands are the UK's largest store of carbon, storing up to eight years of the UK's emissions output in that precious substance. The waterlogged and acidic conditions in the peat prevent decomposition, which is what locks that carbon in. Because of this, keeping the peatlands wet has been highlighted as an environmental priority. These are the grouse moors of Great Britain. Why did they drain the moors in the first place? In the 1940s or 50s after the war, uh, they were really struggling. They wanted a higher food production, so they wanted to drain the moors so you could put a higher headage of sheep on the moors, because farmers were paid on the headage, so they were paid per sheep they could have on the moor. So by the government? By the government, yeah. Now kind of figures we might have four or five hundred sheep on the moor, but in, in 1940-50 they put up to 1,500 sheep. It soon became apparent that this increased burden on the moorland landscapes was not only detrimental to the biodiversity, but also the soft peat earth couldn't handle the volumes of water being sent down these drainage ditches. And over the years, they eroded to enormous sizes. So this is what the grips became. So we're studying what used to be a really small little stream, um, probably only a couple of foot deep, and now it's washed out to this because there was a grip that was put in in the 40s further up. All the water from the grip further up here had to go somewhere, so they channeled it into an existing watercourse, which was this, but obviously it was nothing like the size and the depth that it is now. The amount of water coming down that grip now has washed it out to all this. Um, it's impressive, Yeah. in a bad way. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, all this exposed peat, obviously about three metres deep and probably three, four metres wide at the tops and it opens up further down. Um, the carbon's a, the peat's a huge store of carbon and it, it grows in one millimetre a year in ideal conditions through degrading of sphagnum moss and, and heather as well. Um, so I think the amount of peat, the amount of thousands of years of, of peat has been washed away here already and, and gone down the stream into the main river. We actually want the the water level to be back up right near the top surface, like six inches really, six to inches a foot, keep the water up there um, and re-wet the moors. Times have changed however, and in the last four decades, moorland owners and gamekeepers have been working hard to try and restore these rare environments to their former glory. So what is peatland restoration? Um, basically it's, it's kind of undoing all the, the bad work that's been done from the 20s, 30s, right through to probably the 60s, when the government um, put money in to try and create better grazing habitat for for sheep, uh, for higher food production, um, and also just doing some of the, the damage that was caused by like the lead mine, especially up in the dales here. Some of the main methods we use are uh, grip blocking, um, and then blocking also the wider gullies with timber dams, and then any coir rolls where they've got water run off across a, like a, a flat area um, and, and then brushing on any bare peat um, or exposed peat areas. So this brings me to the helicopter. The ground here is very soft and any attempt to move large quantities of rocks around the moor would likely lead to further damage and vehicles getting stuck on a regular basis. So to minimise impact on vegetation and the environment a helicopter is here instead. So the helicopter is bringing the rocks from the bottom and bringing them up here? Yeah, they are, yeah. It's pretty much a cost effective way of, of bringing the stone up here. You can place them directly in exactly the spot you, you need it, and obviously there's no damage to the vegetation around it or, or the peat hags or like that. It's a stone dam, so it's a semi-permeable semi dam. So it lets water through, but then backs up slightly. And that hopefully creates a bit of sediment. And then over time, that will vegetate probably into sphagnum moss and just slow the water down gradually. These are put down actually every 20 metres up this little 
uh, back at the minute. And these are going all over the estate? Yeah, pretty much all over. Any kind of semi-natural or uh, man-made watercourses these are put on, where, the, where you're down to sediment already, mm -hmm. anywhere where it's, it's still deep peak on a normal grip, they're using like a standard, like a peak grip to block that up. So, so that's the idea. That's what they put these pretty much everywhere throughout the whole estate. It's not only the big gullies they're blocking, but each of the individual small drains called grips has to be blocked in order to achieve the best quality of restoration. This is done with a digger, creating a dam made of the precious peat every few meters, a process that has been carried out by shooting estates for decades. So here's one you prepared earlier. Yeah, uh, this was probably gripped in the 1980s. A lot of states started blocking up grips throughout the country from probably the 80s onwards, all the way right through to the present day. It's been dug out of the digger and then a sod been put into, into the middle of the big old grip. Then that stopped any kind of water flow coming down. There's no bare exposed peat like there was in that big grip that we looked at earlier. So, so this has filled itself here? Yeah, this has filled itself, yeah. It's just like uh, natural regeneration. Um, the sphagnum moss this is the main plant here. So you can see the amount of, and it's clear water, see the amount of water. Wow. Can come out of there, it's unbelievable. So this in itself becomes a natural dam? Yes, exactly. It's this huge giant sponge. So this will gradually wet that water out all the way through the whole year. The theory that everybody wants, keepers want dry moors, but we actually really want the, the wetter areas like these. We find this more beneficial for us, uh, for intervertebrates, for the chicks and then for, for water throughout the year as well. Sphagnum moss is fantastic for creating these bog flushes, but it's not all the being and end all. Yeah, it does store a lot of water, but in the summertime, that top, actually three or four inches of sphagnum will dry out completely and just go um, like tissue paper. And so that will still, if a fire came along, like it was a few years ago on Sadlerworth, the fire would still pass straight over the top of the sphagnum. It won't actually put it out. So re-wetting doesn't prevent wildfires? No. In another effort to promote long-term carbon sequestration, the team are also looking to cover any exposed peat areas. This is done with heather cuttings called brash. So this is what you call brashing? Yes, uh, this is like another form of peatland restoration. So they put the uh, brash down to cover the exposed peat, like you can see behind us here. Hopefully the heather seed, and they also they'll spread extra heather seed on this as well. And then they're gonna plant several thousand uh, sphagnum plugs in amongst this as well. So hopefully create like a little microsite for those plant species to get established now and then cover up this bare peat so it's not got water erosion, peat washing off into the rivers and obviously that exposure of, of carbon. As Dan alluded to, it's not just carbon storage at play here. The restoration work I witnessed today will benefit the hydrology and water quality of the area. The vegetation will change and become more diverse, and the ground nesting birds will benefit from the increases of year-round insect life. So when I was here in the winter, it was very easy to see, after all of that rain, how wet these moors could get. However, I returned here in the summer, after a few months without rain. Back here, Johnny, a little bit different to when you were here last time, Certainly. back in back in winter. Um, yeah, this this gutter here, I would have been probably running with water, big pools every sort of 10 metres. Um, but here we have a man-made grip that's probably put in, in the, the 40s or 50s. Been blocked by the digger. Digger's taken a scoop out here, created this pond and put a block, block in here. So we're looking to create this pond back up and revegetate the, the, uh, the gully behind it. But it's dry but it's dried out. We're at uh, the back end of spring, uh, probably the driest spring on, on record, uh, and there's no water on the moor, on the tops of the moor. Um, so yeah, for, for the grouse and the insects, it's, it's not good at all. Um, the insects need that moisture to, to hatch out, um, and everything needs water to, to survive, to live. So if in the summer there's still a risk of wildfire, in the winter with lots of rain, does the re-wetting stop downstream flooding? 
No, it, it won't stop downstream flooding, but um, the idea is that of the mirrors is a, a massive um, sponge, and uh, once that sponge is full, the water's got to go somewhere, and you get that runoff. Um, what the idea of the re-wetting is is just to slow the flow down and improve the water, the water quality, but uh, it won't um, solve the, the flooding issue. So Ian, the big question is, is it worth all the effort? Yeah, I think here, Johnny, I think um, the work that we've been doing up on the moors uh, with the re-wetting, um, blocking the man-made grips that were sort of put there to drain the moors, we're sort of re-wetting those areas which are creating sort of pools for the, for the grouse and the waders um, to come and drink and bring the chicks for the insects. So you have an increase in insect life the wetter it is. It also slows the water down coming off the moor, so it's that sort of reducing the, the speed of the water coming off the moor. Um, which is in turn going to help the flooding in the lower grounds hopefully. We're sort of locking all that carbon in there um, with the revegetating of the grips, um, reprofiling of the hags, brushing of the, um, the bare peat, uh, stopping the runoff. Um, so we're locking that carbon in there, holding the carbon on the mirrors, locking it in. Um, obviously it, the mirrors hold a lot of carbon anyway, they're doing, a, they're really sort of functioning well, but we're just enhancing it and improving it all the time um, with this work we're doing. Um, also, yeah, the, the water quality, filtering through vegetation rather than running off bare peat, the, the water quality is a lot clearer uh, coming through vegetation. What about negatives? Uh, negatives, um, we can see like some of the areas of our mirror are really wet already, um, which sort of stresses the heather out. And when you get stressed heather, um, it's susceptible to heather beetle. Um, so the heather beetle seems to target really wet heather. Um, um, the root gets stressed out, the plant gets stressed out. Um, really dry heather or overgrazed heather. Um, this is where the, the beetle tends to target. So we're just worried in the future where we've sort of re-wetted a lot of areas that are already wet. Um, it's going to spread the, the heather beetle out further um, and sort of stress more heather out. But that's something in time that we can we can look at, um, and hopefully, yeah, a lot of this is, is trial work on our ground, and um, over time things might change um, for the better, some for the worse. But um, yeah, the science is sort of still waiting on that, and um, we'll we'll sort of keep monitoring it. On my way back home, I'd arranged to stop in at a couple of different estates to speak with their keepers about their own peatland restoration experiences. Does every moor need re-wetting? Uh, re-wetting a moorland is a huge buzzword at the moment. Um, and given that we've had three successive springs really dry, um, you know, obviously wetness affects insect levels. All the wildlife, um, ground nesting birds rely on abundance of insects. Um, so I don't think there's many keepers that would be against re-wetting. But what is very clear is that every piece of moorland is different. So on this moor here, you have areas that are naturally wetter, areas that are drier. We've got various different types of soil types, and peat depths, We've got free draining areas, and then other areas that hold the water. Um, also, you know, that affects how much the vegetation grows. So, so some areas we have growth rates, which are huge, that you know, if we were allowed to, we could burn or cut every six years. Then other areas, it might be 20, 25 years. But when you put a management plan, a blanket management plan on the whole area, you know, that's where the trouble starts. So every part or every moor in the country is following very similar laws and guidelines? Yes. What would you rather? Um, I, I, it's not a good thing to micromanage and have to do, you know, a tiny little management structure for every bit the practitioner on the ground should be given more free reign he knows his ground he knows the wet areas where the vegetation grows the most um, and that just works from doing an office based uh, management plan has inherent problems So how long has your restoration re-wetting project been going on? It's been ongoing since 2010. 
How have you found it's affected the moor over that time? Huge benefit. Creating these wet flushes, cotton grass flushes, you, know, you can see here, unfortunately, we've not had any rain for quite a while. So the water pool has eventually dried out, but you can see, I mean, looking here, these moths, invertebrates, all sorts in here. You know, there's still a little bit of moisture in there, which you, know, you can see there's a source of something in, in a time like this where it's as dry. That's significantly better than yeah, no water. What happens is. if there was no water? What would happen? Well, I mean, invertebrates are key to chick survival, not just grouse. All your small birds, skylarks, metapipits, your curlews need damp areas to be able to probe and feed. All, all waders do. You know, and the comparison of this to out there, literally just a few metres away, where it's, it's dried out, you can imagine you know, anybody who's ever dug a garden over in dry weather, you don't see worms until you get down to moisture, and it's exactly the same on a mower. Will the rewetting work stop wildfires if that's dry and this little bit's wet? No. No, not a chance. I mean, you can see there's a tiny bit of moisture left in there, but once you get away from it, this sphagnum here, where you see it's bone dry, you'll get a wildfire coming through here. This is not going to stop it. This will burn the same as everything else. Yeah, yeah. and we've seen it. We've seen it at uh, the Saddleworth fire, and we've also seen it at the Crowden fire this year, where it's entered these re-wetted areas of fire, and it's skipped straight across. You might prevent the, uh, the damage into the ground. It might make it more resilient from deep burning fires, yeah. but you'll not stop it from skipping across here and taking the whole mower. It helps the peak, but perhaps not the vegetation. Yeah, and the, the, the vegetation is the issue. You know, surface fires, you know, surface temperatures and, and the dryness at the moment, you know, it's just, you know, it's an accident waiting to happen. Where does rewilding fit in with rewetting? It doesn't really. You know, in terms of the rewetting work that we've carried out here, you know, there's been a great deal of time, effort and money put into it to make these moors wetter. You know, we're retaining water, which is beneficial to everything. Um, we're slowing down the water runoff, which is beneficial to water providers. Um, and you know, we all know that, that wet peat moorland retains 10 times more carbon than woodland. So the woodland would suck all the water out of the ground? Without a doubt, yeah. I mean, the argument of rewilding the uplands, clough woodlands are one thing on the steep, dry bank yeah. sides, on these uplands, these, these high tops like this, you know, we need to keep them wet. There's a huge amount of wildlife that's dependent on this environment. And take that away, you know, it'll see the end of golden plover, it'll see the end of curlew. You know, without these upland areas like this, there's no hope for them. So it's about creating a balance of wet tops, cloughs on the side and fields in the bottom. It is, yeah, yeah, ex so exactly you get that, that benefit for everything. Yeah, yeah, you've got this, this open moorland up here, which has been re-wetted, you know, and it's good for all ground nesting waders and songbirds. You know, clough woodland, which is good for all the other bird life. Um, we're blocking the gullies up here. We're retaining the water. Clough woodland is slowing the runoff down as well. And then down into some marginal in by ground, which again, you know, benefits a whole host of other wildlife. Peatland restoration, carbon sequestration, or just moorland rewetting. Call it what you will. It's clearly important work to help slow climate change. Undoing the damage that the government funded all those years ago is a task that has been taken up with great enthusiasm by the grouse moors of Britain. That I've learned have been working towards this goal for many years. Over time, new research will show us the true value of the hard work these men and women are putting in today. And as ever, they will adapt to these findings for the benefit of conservation and the environment.